three but times. You were all, I kind of whispered that and put a bug in your ear that that was something that was a concern. So you knew that was coming, right? I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, okay. I haven't looked at my email. It was just a term we used to know. What's the topic? The PD fire department. Voting day. Voting day in the PD fire department? Yeah. Okay, I can talk to you about that. Yeah. But I, I said we're having a meeting tomorrow. Well, whether it goes on in November, we put it up. Are we waiting for June? Oh, 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 Remember we oh, talked about that? that? Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Okay, don't be sorry. I'm trying to have a little bit on your plate. I'm in the process of changing jobs. So. What? Yeah. Are you leaving there? No, uh, yes and no. I'm actually uh, moving to the corporate office. So where's that? Um, actually, it's closer. It's like 30 minutes uh, less. Well, an hour less commute a day. Like to and from, so it's only 18 minutes from the house. That's great. Oh my gosh. That's so the light is on, so we're going to get started. Uh, we welcome everybody. This is a workshop of the Scarborough Town Council. Um, the single item that we're discussing tonight is, um, and uh, ancillary issues around that is around the uh, school budget and the referendum question that needs to occur. Um, with that, I kind of want to. So this purpose of this workshop is for us to be able to um, share our thoughts about. Um, different parts of the uh, issue and different parts of the process, um, as well as um, talk about what are our next steps, including setting the public hearing and second reading, and then also the referendum date will be um, discussed tonight, as well as um, what adjustments, if any, um, and what department um, should uh, be impacted, and then what the net impact of that is, um, and then uh, talk about what are our next steps, because um, I know that there's some conversation or desired conversation around some uh, issues that aren't necessarily related to the budget article itself, uh, but about process and uh, participation and other char char uh, characterizations. So um, just uh, a high level before I uh, kind of uh, put the questions out for us to talk about this. Um, and by the way, we will have public comment at the end of the uh, workshop. That way you, those people who are here can hear what we are talking about and then they can give us feedback. Keep in mind you'll also have an opportunity um, at the meeting that immediately follows that starts at 7 o'clock as well. Even though it's not on the agenda, we will have it as a, a typo uh, for being excluded. Um, so just uh, some highlights um, on the observations of the votes um, and where there might be some possible consensus items uh, for bullets. One is that the last vote, we acknowledge that the last vote failed by 83 votes um, and that we are getting closer to um, what is um, acceptable to the community. Uh, there is no clear mandate for any significant reductions. Um, and when I'm talking, Tom will share a little bit later on because um, definitions of words used matter. So significant will be defined in the sense that Tom will share some budget numbers um, and the impact of those numbers. Um, I think there might be a general consensus that this is no longer about the overall tax rate, um, especially given uh, feedback that we've heard. And um, the big part for us is to make sure that we stay on task and afford on the voters the maximum opportunities to be able to come out and vote and support the school's budget as well as the town overall. Um, with those kind of observations, really the first question that we should ask ourselves and have a conversation is what's the preferred date for the third referendum vote? We will then back from that date if we come to a consensus that will be uh, possibly the first uh, amendment um, on the motion um, and then we will work back on when the public hearing and the second reading uh, would actually be because there are state statute requirements based on the number of days and so forth. So um, um, just to remind uh, the uh, viewers as well as citizens, um, the statute is uh, the vote must be held no sooner than 10 days and no more than 45 days from July 25th. The latest day um, to be able to have that vote is on Thursday, September 8th. Um, there are three opportunities for us to have that referendum. Um, as the motion was originally drafted and proposed by staff, um, it was August 22nd, which is the minimum date uh, that we were comfortable in putting forward. August 29th is an alternative. Um, it is the first day of school for transition students, so about one-third of the students are impacted, or their families are impacted because it's a busy day uh, for them um, in that transition. And then September 5th is the first day after Labor Day and would be the last opportunity. But there are some limited circumstances surrounding that that we can talk about um, on each one of the opportunities. So the question I have is, do you want to start talking about um, September 5th and work backwards to the 22nd? How, what would you like to do? Sure, I'd start with the 5th since that seems to be what, I think those are, that's the biggest consensus that I've seen out of emails is that people want it on the 5th. I'm happy with that. 
I'd be okay with that. I'd like to hear from the town manager as before we start discussing it amongst ourselves. Yeah, I would just observe uh, the only challenge that Tony's made me aware of on that day because it follows the holiday. Uh, the two days prior to a, the election are reserved for special circumstance early voting. Uh, interestingly enough, we had 50 people uh, qualify for special circumstance the day before the last one on the 24th. Uh, so uh, I would just observe that just the uniqueness of a, having a holiday precede this vote uh, will make that challenging. Is that a legal obligation or is yeah. that just a courtesy? I believe it's a legal obligation. So that would rule out the fifth? It wouldn't rule it out. No. Uh, it, it would just would be a limiting factor for voters. Would they have to go to Thursday and Friday before the weekend? Monday I think it's the two calendar days proceeding. Um, so it has to be the I can have Tony Committee clarify. I'm not an election okay. expert. So I wouldn't think I don't would think that's an issue. So I don't know if it's tragic. I just want to observe that that's just a challenge. N frankly, none of these dates are terrific. Let's face it; it's a rough time of year uh, to be asking people to come up. Uh, with respect to the date, I think my biggest concern is uh, is that we fail on the third vote, and then it presents real challenges for us. Um, even September 5th will allow us, I believe, to be able to get bills out on schedule. Uh, just for background, the way that works, uh, we've already set, and we could modify it, we've set the first half payment due date of October 15th, and we have to give at least 30 days notice between the time that a, a taxpayer receives the bill and when that first due date is. Uh, is. So I think we can turn that around, uh, just appreciate that there's some administrative things once we know the the two variables of setting the tax rate, we then have to do some internal conversions. It takes us a couple days to proof that out. We send it to a third party to print the bills. They do it and they, and they mail them. So there's maybe a week lag between when we're ready to go and when we actually send the bills. Is, is it possible, I don't know if this is legal again or not, but is it possible to, we have two payments, if there is an adjustment, make an adjustment to the second half payment or they have to be two equal payments? You know what I'm saying? Whereas if we, the first tax bill goes out, if the budget hasn't been set or finalized yet, it's, a, it's an estimate anyway, it's, well, it's not an estimate, it's only 50% of the taxes due. Can we then make an, if the budget comes in later than that, can we make an adjustment to that second payment? Or is it has to be one to say? Uh, it may be set? legally possible. I think it'll be practically a nightmare, to okay. be honest with you. Okay. Um, I think if we're going to set the tax rate and we can get in, we're getting ahead of ourselves a bit, but uh, there are abilities in statute to go ahead and set tax rate based on the last budget that was approved by this body. Mm -hmm. um, that would enable us to, to move forward. Um, but I, if we do that, I would not recommend once the budget is finalized, we then issue new bills based on the new rate. I think that would just be uh, exactly. extremely difficult to administer. Can I, can I ask then, if, if we're sending out tax bills based on the last budget that's approved by this body, why would we even wait for the, why would the September 5th date even have an impact? Well, arguably, we'd be raising more tax revenue than is needed for operations. No, I, I understand that, but I'm saying if it fails, and we we would then we still have to get our tax bills out. We have to do some kind of commitment based on something. Um, you know, nothing would really materially change. We wouldn't have time to turn around a second budget before we could send out the first payment. So, does that make sense? I'm no, I'm sorry, I'm not following the question. I think I'm following what Maybe you could explain better. So. Well, I think, it, I mean, it was kind of to what Chris was saying, is that we'd have to make an adjustment in the second half. So whether we ended up, if the budget fails and we have to follow the first, you know, follow the budget <coughs> as is, then at that point, at some point, we we're going to pass the budget and you'd have to make an adjustment there anyway. So it but wouldn't seem to effectively make a big difference. No, that wasn't quite what I meant. I wasn't saying that we that we would change it. It's just that in this case, we would we would not be raising the correct amount. If, if this budget fails, we'd have to get the tax bill out. We can't change it. Right. Um, but um, but, I, but I guess maybe the question is, if we do charge it, if we end up raising too much money, because once we set the tax rate, it's set, and this budget fails, and we keep through going through that process, at what point does it impact the, the, the process, because once the tax rate is set, it's set. It really wouldn't. If you make the decision for us to commit taxes, set the tax rate and commit taxes based on the last failed budget, mm -hmm. we would do that and we would go on in our normal course of activities. I, I presume that you'll pass the budget. You will ultimately, and the voters yeah. will validate it. I presume it's likely to be less than your last one that failed. So I'm just observing that the consequences that we're going to be raising more than would be needed otherwise. And in that instance, 
that money in theory would go to fund balance or that money would have to be refunded or what would be the what would be a consequence of raising too much money in no, the tax I believe it would fall to fund balance. It would not be needed to cover operations. It would okay. be tax receipts in excess of estimate and it would become fund balance. So it can't so it cannot be spent because the budget limits as no, it wasn't approved. It wasn't approved as an expense. I'm limited by the budget authority you give me. Right. You can't spend any more than you've authorized. Yeah, and we, we would look. I can't. I can't even fathom uh, sending out tax bills based on a budget that failed. No, I, I'm, I think we're just exploring. I, I, I'm not suggesting we do that either. I'm just exploring what the consequences are if this budget fails again, right. and we have to set a tax rate. Then what are the ramifications of the budget failing? That's one option, and right. the statute clearly anticipated this eventuality. I'm not sure if it's ever actually been exercised anywhere else in the state, but it's mm -hmm. there, and we can. It's available. The other uh, option is for us to issue uh, tax anticipation notes, which is something that's done fairly routinely by municipalities. We haven't done it here since the mid-80s, uh, but that is a financial vehicle that recognizes there's a delay in your, in this case, tax receipts, yet we have bills to pay. And so it's borrowing money short term. Uh, there are interest um, consequences associated with that approach. And I think, I, I think that there is, um, ancillary risk involved. So while, uh, so keep in mind is that the, because it's going to be an interest charge um, expense that goes up as a result of the tax anticipation note. So any adjustment we make tonight is then offset by a failure, is offset by an increase in an interest expense of, of the same amount, if not more. Actually, potentially, it's potentially more. Well, so, also so what do we gain um, by that type of plan? Um, as far as the fifth, um, I actually don't support it. And the reason is because if it's 50 people who are being suppressed from being able to vote because of circumstances and guarantee, you never know when those circumstances happen, I would rather not have that. And I think the date that works is the 29th as a result of that because there are people that also commute. Um, I commute an hour a day, um, uh, uh, sorry, an hour um, in the morning and an hour in the afternoon before the polls open and after the polls close. So to get back here to be able to vote and not have that day before to be able to have a circumstance if I couldn't, and I'm the only one, um, I'll do absentee, but there's a lot of people that don't plan like that, and I think having that Monday for those special circumstances is absolutely important. Yeah, I, I just want to, before we jump to the discussion, but I'm not sure I'm clear, and I guess this is a question of the town manager, Tom, I, I, mm -hmm. the question I think Chris asked, would it be illegal if we end up in that place with a failed budget and so the first tax bills that go out with the last budget that failed, and then we do pass the budget, there's nothing illegal, per se, of changing the second billing to reflect, I mean, it's, I understand it's administratively complex, but we could make that adjustment on the second billing so we don't actually have generating reserves that don't go directly back to the taxpayers. I mean, there's nothing, to, there's nothing to say we can't do that. Dude. I suspect you're right. I think if there's a will to do that, there's a way to do it. I don't think it's illegal, but I think it's problematic. Uh, Ruth is raising her The hand. assessor is allowed to do one commitment per year. This would require a second commitment to change. It would require abatements to all of the property owners and then reissuing. So I don't think that that would be a feasible process. Uh, and speaking to the attorneys, they had... Uh, said that we would only have the one commitment and because I was concerned about refunding folks, you know, 9,900 property taxes. And, and well, you wouldn't have to refund them, you'd just... Well, but um, mm -hmm. she said that there was one commitment and and everything close to the general fund fund balance and to be used for future So I think, taxes. so I just want to understand that then. So that, then there's... <coughs> If we then we legally can't set the commitment before the budget is passed, then so we because we can only set it once. If we don't have a passed budget by the time the October tax bills are going, we're then forced to go into a tax anticipation. No, no, the no. statute clearly allows you to set uh, commit taxes and, okay. uh, based on the on the last approved budget by this body. So in this case, mm -hmm. uh, you could do it now if you wished, mm -hmm. based on the failed vote on the 25th based on that amount. And what is the impact of the budget finally passing then? Because once we make that tax commitment, like Ruth said, we can only make that commitment once. So if we make that commitment now, mm -hmm. and we, the bills go out in October, mm -hmm. the budget fails, we have a second budget that's reduced even further. What impact does that budget vote have on our tax commitment at that point? Uh, nothing on the commitment. The commitment's done, tax receipts are flowing in at that point. It's all reserves. Yeah, and it would ultimately 
show itself as mm -hmm. year-end fund balance, if you will. Okay. okay. So the, you know, my quotes in the paper had more to do, and forgive me, but it's my job to worry, and it's not a worry, but to anticipate these sorts of things. Um, and uh, Ruth and I have been already just kind of gearing up for what is the eventuality, what are the consequences of this, and it, it was really intended to be uh, trying to get ahead of this and understand what the impact of further delays of uh, the tax commitment and, and the budget approval are. One, one last question. If, if we were to go to that, you know, having to borrow money for the tax, if that's the route we went, there's that direct consequence of interest payments. But as we're looking down the road of trying to maybe a $22 million or $20 million public safety building borrowing on bonds and borrowing bonds for maybe some down the road, it, could that action of having to borrow money short term because we can't pass a budget, could it have an impact on bond ratings downstream? It could. Our financial advisor has said that the rating agencies will, will not be pleased with that. Um, they like to have the comfort that the voters um, Orderly. It's yeah, uh, so I, I can't say it will definitely have an impact, but it's certainly something that they will take note of, and so it could have an impact um, on that on that bond issue. Yes, and, and, on, and the type of money we're talking about, even even a couple quarter of percentage points. Yeah, has. a couple of tenths of the basis points would, would can make a difference with that kind of money for sure. And just to put a, a finer point to it, and these are the things that I don't expect anyone here to appreciate. Um, October happens to be a really expensive month for us. Half of our debt is uh, due in October. Our full county tax payment is due in October. Uh, we probably have $10 million going out the door that, that month. Um, so even borrowing for 90-day period, which is probably what we need to do, practically speaking, we're looking at a sixty dollars to $100,000 interest expense. Um, and I'm providing that range because for us to do this, we need a full-blown cash flow analysis so we can demonstrate what our actual need is. But we we estimate on the conservative side we'll need $15 million to get by and keep hmm. keep current on payments and maybe as high as $25 million. Yeah, that doesn't seem like a good option. The option is what do we need to do tonight to pass a budget? The Fair 29th enough. or the thing? <coughs> Plus the process to go into, you have to go through an RFP, outside of the cash flow analysis, you have to go through an RFP process. Yeah, and that's, option. you know, for that to go through, you're talking 10 to 15 days before you even get the offers back. Yeah, and I don't think it'd be a full-blown full blown official statement, but we've got to prepare a, a fair amount of financial yeah. information so these institutions, uh, you know, the, the, the more information we give them, the better rates we're likely to get. So there's several weeks of work for us to do to prepare for that if that's the route we take. So, so I guess then having said that, and to Peter's point of, you know, right now we're not talking about reduction, we're talking about dates. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 if I understand correctly, Tom, there's, there's no administrative challenges for September 5th. The challenge comes if it fails on September 5th, correct? Correct. Okay. So I, I agree with Kate. You know, it seems like almost all the messages that we got, whether you, whatever, whatever approach you want to take, the one thing that seemed to be the consensus builder across the whole thing was that date. So I, I agree with you, Sean. I mean, I think it's, it's a, I, you know, the 29th I think was a good compromise, but I, I think the 5th, in my mind, um, as long as there's no financial impact on the town, uh, everybody is aware that if this doesn't fail, then the wheels are going to come off the bus, so to speak, and uh, we're going to have a lot of work ahead of us, and it's not it's not going to be good for the town. But I, I think that voter, the voter availability, as long as it's still available on Thursday and Friday. Which it would in any circumstance. It's just whether or not you have right. the Sunday, I'm sorry, the Monday, the Monday after right. any emergency circumstances because right. you never know. I mean, right. the clerk told us that um, she knows of at least one circumstance where someone was put into the hospital, mm -hmm. didn't get out, sure. and uh, had to come in, you know, wasn't able to get here on a Friday. So. Yeah. They came in on that Monday. I did want to share also, just on the timeline, um, some historical perspective because it's about the convenience for the voters as well. So if we set this for September 5th, it would actually be 22 days between the second reading and the actual vote. If we set it for the, ninth, uh, the 29th, it would be 18 days. In comparison to the last cycle that we went through, which was in 2015, both of the referendums after the first failure, you have both referendums afterwards um, between that second reading and the vote uh, were only 13 days apiece. 
So both of our options are more convenient and um, um, a better opportunity for the citizens. I even went back as far as the clerk did it for me. In 2013, there was only eight days. 2010, there was nine. And in 2008, there was only four. So historically, um, when people are talking about voter suppression, the schedule that we are talking about tonight in no way sets um, that precedent. In fact, even if we selected the 22nd, it would be 13, which is consistent with the last two cycles that we had to go through multiple. So I want citizens to understand that there has been no attempt and there's no desire by anybody for voter suppression. The schedule is about convenience and both of the two options that we're at least talking about amending from, I mean, even the baseline is still con you know, consistent with past practices. <coughs> So it seems my, we just, oh, go ahead, Katie. I was going to say, my, my biggest concern is just that we separate up separate the public hearing from the second reading, which we've now done. We've gone, that's right. We will. We, we will, yep. right. Um, so I, I'm not super tight we? to either day, but we I will, will say, okay. as Kate and Chris both said, um, you know, what, we, what we've heard from a lot of people has been the fifth. Have we separated out the public hearing from so the second reading? So the current motion that's being, at least for the first reading before amended, has public uh, hearing and the second reading together on the 22nd. No. However, on the 8th. I'm sorry, on the 8th. On the 8th. Right. However, with any amendment tonight, then that would also be a, a point of uh, discussion or a point that should be. But we haven't, dis we haven't no. decided that. I hope we don't. That was what I thought you were saying, though. <coughs> it would allow for it. It would allow for it. It would allow for it. To be separated. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, <coughs> we have a regular meeting on the 16th, anyway. Yes. Right. Just, just keep in mind, uh, you need to prioritize what's important. Is, is what's important that the election day is the most convenient for, for voters, or do you want to maximize the opportunity, and or do you want to maximize the opportunity for early or absentee voting? Those are two considerations that... Um, and that happens because if we combine the public hearing and the second reading together, the second reading is done, and therefore you can start SD voting the next day is how Tody usually manages it. So Plus, people know. They don't have to right. wait another week we, to well, find right. out what, what the number is. Are we still, is that still germane to this conversation? Sure. Dates? Okay. So then I, I mean, yeah. I, I mean I, honestly, at this point, it's not like we're introducing the budget from the beginning, and it's a binder thick full of, of information. Um, I, I would prefer to allow for as long of absentee voting as possible and, and therefore have the public hearing and the second reading combined uh, simply because th we're really only talking about, in essence, one issue. Uh, I don't think there's a whole lot of research that needs to be done about it that hasn't been done already. Uh, but that's just, that's, that's my opinion. So. I think that's, that, uh, personally, I think that's going to not go over well at all. I think people are going to be curious if we do that. Um, through this entire process, the thing, one, two out of the five things that we keep hearing over and over again, that's one of the things they keep telling us is, let us have time to swallow this information. Let us have time to get the information, get the information out. And I think if we, if we put those two together, we're completely taking that off the table for them. And I think that's going to be an issue. Just from the, the emails that I've seen, I think if we put those, we put second reading and public hearing together, it's not going to be pretty. It won't be pretty. Oh, it's about consistency, so people get used to it being separated, and then all of a sudden, when it combines, they get confused. And I know that's not anybody's doing it. Not, no one's doing it intentionally, but I think that's the perception sometimes. And as we've learned, perception sometimes um, bites us. And that that was my concern in wanting wanting them separated out, just to be really consistent. Right. So, but I think Tom's point is well taken. What do we want to achieve with this? Do we want to give people time for absentee voting, as much time as possible to get to the polls for voter convenience, or do we really have a lot of information that needs to be digested and processed ahead of time? So I'm, I'm, you know, to me, I like I said, I think it's about allowing as many people to get to the polls as possible, and and have that that longer extension because, as I said, I, I mean, I don't, I, you know, I, I'm, I, I'll go either way to be honest with you. I just think that, uh, you know, I don't think it's. It, in my mind, it's not as big of an issue now because the information that we're trying to process, is, it's not that really complex at this point. It's, it's fairly straightforward. So there isn't, it's not like we're talking about, you know, which departments are coming and how we're splitting things out and, you know, it seems like it's a pretty straightforward discussion of, you know, what the number's going to be and that's it. And well, I, and well, I, I, I agree with that completely. I mean, we're basically yeah. talking about a week here. Right. Um, you know, I believe that if you if you want to vote, you're going to go vote. 
whether you have three weeks or two weeks. If you're going to go do it, you're going to go do it. Um, and I think perception is a big problem that we have right now. And I think um, consistency is something that we need to really start paying attention to. And for me, that's, that would be my motivation behind it, is making sure that people are getting the information that they need the way that they are asking us to provide it. So, so I'm just I'm, I'm a little confused on which, which. So going back to the first question, I think I'm okay on the 5th, going to the 5th for the vote. And the reason I'm there is, I mean, I kept track. I responded to every, there was 100 emails that we got. And you're right, that was a consistent theme. The one thing there's clear consensus on is pushed out as far as you can so people have time to get information and be prepared and be able to have comment and input and all that stuff. So the answer to the first question, I would be on the, on the fifth. And then as we talk about the second question, which is really do we separate, I would, I would be, I think if we can, if the time allows, and I have, we haven't talked about dates, I think if we can accommodate it, we should separate the public hearing from the second read. Because one of the things we got back in our focus groups is when we have a public hearing and then we immediately go into it, we haven't had time to digest what's been said to us, so maybe we can reformulate our opinion. So if possible, that's where I would be if that's helpful. Thank you. Um, so I would say that if we are going to move to September 5th and we were to have a second reading on August 16th, that gives us three weeks for the, for the vote. Um, we have the meeting anyway. We're going to be here. Um, it seems like that's a lot of time, and, and to your point, Peter, it gives people an opportunity to influence how it is that we vote. So I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> when, when, when. Except for the, obviously the Monday holiday, that's inconvenient. But I don't think we can cancel Labor Day. <laughs> we can try. Yeah. We can do anything. Go. <laughs> The extended voting uh, of early voting, I think, is a good idea, and it kind of outweighs the. We don't lose the ability for special uh, circumstances that just exist on a Thursday and a Friday instead of a Friday and a Monday. So uh, I'm okay with that. There was such broad support, <coughs> un or almost universal support for this, and it was extensive. It, uh, we, we must have gotten a hundred emails yeah, we did. from people on both sides of the question, and so if that seems to be important and I think what they want is they want to know what the number is and they want to know it as soon as possible. I don't think they want us to split uh, the uh, uh, into uh, second uh, uh, have a, uh, a public hearing then a second reading. I think they want us to hold uh, public hearing and second reading simultaneously make a decision on the number and then they know the number uh, and that way they can then act upon it and make arguments, try and influence their friends and, and whatnot, and get people out to vote. So I'm actually in between the two. Big surprise. Um, well, I'm still, I'm trying to get, I, I've got 40, 30, 30 minutes to get over the hurdle of picking September 5th, which I probably <laughs> will agree with. Well, there's, I mean, there's people that are, that are going to be um, not able to vote that given those emergency circumstances, and that's not fair to them. Um, at the same time, I balance it by suggesting is that uh, they have plenty of time to do absentee voting before that. Um, but as far as the, um, the public hearing and second reading, to me, it's purely b it depends on how much we make an adjustment. If we make an adjustment that's nominal and has very little impact, I have no problem putting the two together because it's not um, about the dollar. But if we achieve some people's goals of whether it's 3% net increase of the school's budget, you're talking not to steal Tom's analysis he'll share, you're talking about a million and a half dollars. If we have a million and a half dollar adjustment to the school budget, this absolutely has to be split into a public hearing and a second reading on two different days. If it's $50,000 or $10,000, whatever it might be, you could do it in one, because I don't believe that um, uh, the impact is what it's going to be focused on. So really, I'd like to have a conversation about the adjustments before I get into is, it, is the two meetings going to be one, is it going to be separated? Very, very different circumstances. And I agree. I agree with that. And again, I'll just say it one more time. I, I won't say it again tonight. Uh, if for me, it's just about the consistency factor and keeping things the way that we've been doing them for people who are used to the way that we do it. And we're going to catch heat no matter what way we go. But I think we should respect the process and 
if we do respect the process and do it the way that we've been doing it, then we can at least say that this is the way we've been doing it and this is the way we're going to continue to do it. Um, but I do understand what your point is, and I agree with it, that there's a big difference between a small cut and a million and a half dollar cut. That's just a huge difference. And one of the things the clerk did look at for me as well is how many times in the past for consistency have we had the first reading and second reading on the same date. And in every year prior that we had multiple referendums, in 2015, um, the two referendums afterwards were both on public hearings and second reading were on the same date. The same thing in 13, the same thing in 10, and the same thing in 9. So from a historical perspective, they were held on the same date regardless of any circumstances. The question is, what do we want to do? And again, for me, it's just, it, for me, it comes down to the dollar. Yeah, and the hard part for me What's is, look, I mean, I understand those numbers, but like we've talked about, we're in a totally different world now. And 2009, 2010, nobody cared. Nobody was even showing up. Maybe they cared, but they weren't coming. They weren't sending us emails. I know because I was here. You've been here. We have email then? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they could call us. We had our, mo our voicemail boxes at Town Hall. Um, and we we didn't hear from anybody. Never, ever. And I, I don't think in up until last year was the first year I got an email about the budget. So I think we're dealing with a, with a different time and a different group of, of voters that want to be informed and want to have an, in, you know, be interactive. And I think we have to respect that. Yeah, and like I said, I could go either way, but I think Tom's, I think Tom's kind of spelled it out for us very clearly, what the two consequences are, right? Is it, you know, if we, do we want to allow more time for early voting, or do we want to allow more time for input in the decision-making process? And, you know, so I, like I said, I go either way. Um, I think Sean's point's a good one. If it's, if it's not a significant impact, then I, I, then I don't know what the need is for, I mean, I don't know what the need is for more public input. Right. I don't know how much of an impact separating out public comment to uh, second reading it's going to be when the goal would be to have allow people as much time to vote as possible. So, so the question is, is how much input do we, do we really need or do we want? Uh, do we feel that we need to make an informed decision or is the voting, time for voting more important? So like I said, I can go either way, um, I, but I think we're, it sounds like we're on the fifth. And I'm, I'm, I mean, well, yeah. uh, some of them, some of them, sorry. So, no, no. Um, the consensus is definitely that it's the September 5th, so I would expect a motion to change. I'm sorry. Oops. I was going to change it. Oh. I have a marginally related question. Okay. <laughs> um, I'd like to, uh, uh, do we have an idea of when we could expect the uh, property valuation to come back? Because that I'm scheduled to have it, uh, to know it by August 18th, that Friday. That's always been our internal deadline. Okay. And, and does it ever come in early? <laughs> like, for instance, so if we move the second reading to the 16th, well, is there a chance that we could know it at second reading if we were to move it to the 16th? I can speak to them in the assessor's office, but I, I try to respect their their sure. time frames. Uh, we've got some challenges with, with staff at this point, um, but I, I can certainly find out. Yeah, keep it, just for the public, keep in mind we are currently using consulting services for our assessor's office, so we're dealing with outside contractors at the moment. Well, even if we weren't, we still can't influence the decision. Sure. It's, it's up right. to them. It's not about the time. Yeah. This isn't something I want to rush. I want to make sure that they're comfortable yeah, yeah. and make it to the place that they're comfortable. Especially given the impact of uh, state laws that just recently changed regarding homestead exemption and the impact that's going to have on the process. Um, so back to, uh, I believe there's a consensus that there will be an amendment uh, to adjust the date from the 22nd to the 5th. Mm -hmm. We can talk about the public hearing and second reading after we get through the next two parts of this conversation, which is around the adjustments and where. And then we can, as far as for the regular meeting, we'll go back to in setting the public hearing and second reading based upon um, the conversation. So the next part of the conversation, because we have uh, 25 minutes, is um, what should the reduction uh, be and where should it come from? Are you looking at me? Bill. I'm, I'm not looking at you. I'm looking at you. What I guess I pose the question to the seven of us, is there anyone who thinks it should come from anything other than the school budget? Since that's the sense I've gotten. Does anyone else think that the town budget should be reopened? Because that simplifies the question. If no one feels that way, I think we have our answer. So I, I would say it depends on the, what we're trying to achieve and the size of the cut that we're looking at. If we're, if we're trying to reduce the tax rate significantly, I think that needs to be a shared burden. If we are 
Um, if we're doing something else, then then I guess I'm open to that. So I, I think it, I'd like to have a qualified maybe. Okay. So, so I, I guess would, oh, sorry. No, no, no. Um, I would kind of echo it. For me, it, it kind of depends on what it is. I feel like we, I, even though I voted against opening the municipal budget last time, the reason I did that was because I felt like it was going to hurt our ability to pass the budget. <coughs> It maybe it did, maybe it didn't. I don't you know, we can speculate all day long, but um I feel like what we did was somewhat nominal and they were cost savings we were going to occur anyway. So my preference would be if we were going there, um, that we really go there and that would mean some really tough conversations. But if if we have to make that kind of really sizable cut, um, and that's what we're talking about doing, then I'm not completely opposed to it. I'm open to listening. So I guess I'll 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 throw the throw a, a, a stake in the ground and say I I, I would suggest uh, fifty thousand a fifty thousand dollar reduction coming only from the schools. And I do that for a couple of reasons. Um, first, um, I, I think that the I, I do think you know. Elections do have consequences, and it was clear it didn't pass. And I think we do need to make some kind of adjustment. As much as I would love to be able to just wait for the valuation piece, turn it around, and reintroduce it again, I don't think that's the issue anymore. I think we're starting to hear that it's not about it's not about the tax rate anymore. It's it's about specific departments, and I don't I don't. Um, personally accept that because we have a very thorough and detailed and intricate budget process where we evaluate that that kind of stuff. So <clears throat> I'm comfortable with our process. I think our, our our budget was personally I felt it was reasonable, but I do think we have to make an adjustment of some kind. Um, I think, you know, uh, fifty thousand dollars is as good as any other amount, um, only because if it's not if it's too small um, I think it's it's seen as not impactful. If it's too large, I think it ends up cutting services uh, to a point where one of our goals last year and, and to some extent this year, although I don't know if we absolutely reiterate it, was we wanted to maintain level services in the town. And that was an important aspect of what we were doing. And I think up until this point, we've been kind of nibbling around the edges of it. And I think we all kind of came to the conclusion at the last go around that anything below what we what we put out there last time for reductions, both town and school, would result in, in reduced services. And I, I really want to uh, that that that's my kind of personal line is to say I don't I don't think that it's fair that we that we start cutting services across the board to the town or the or the school. And I think while fifty thousand dollars is significant to the schools and I know it is and I know it's going to mean something, uh, I don't think it's catastrophic. And so I think it's a it's a reaction. I think it's a measured reaction, and I think it's an appropriate level. Tom, do you have, the, do you have any breakdowns for us, numbers-wise, like what um, what's that going to do as of right now? To what the tax rate? Mm -hmm. To the fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollar cut. I just did it. Uh, so to the tax rate, it takes us from two point nine nine percent to two point nine one percent, or you know, sixteen dollars and forty cents to sixteen dollars and thirty eight cents. Can you can you look at a hundred thousand and what it does to the tax rate? Uh I'm sorry, the valuation on a hundred on a, a three hundred thousand dollar home on the average home mm -hmm. now? No, I think she it would produce a hundred thousand. Yeah, one hundred thousand set up. Oh. <laughs> it would produce uh expected tax rates of two point eight two percent. So it would go down from two nine one to two eight two. As it stands up right. <laughs> so, in essence, so in essence, for every fifty as of right now, for every fifty thousand dollars, it'll take the tax rate down on a percentage basis, percentage. Uh, point zero eight. And it sounded like it was four cents, no, two cents. Is it two cents on the actual mill rate? So it was almost a little over a penny on the mill rate. On the mill rate. So for every fifty thousand bucks, it's about a penny. Can I, can, I, can I take a shot at something? I think to yeah. back up just before we get to numbers, mm -hmm. um, for me and I, and I really apologize, Sean and I. I should have tried to get to Sean quicker and have a more of a conversation with Sean. 
I tried to put out something yesterday, and I, and I, have, I spent a lot of time talking to a lot of different people. And before we get to the number, and I think the superintendent, Julie, had said it really well, and actually in an email I think she sent to us saying, she thinks this may no longer be about numbers. It's more about culture and how we interact with each other as a community and talk to each other and other things. And I, spent, and I think we're closer than we think. I don't think we need a huge adjustment. But I think what the questions we are is more of a forward-looking question. And so some things that I heard resonate that could get us to yes, because when you look at the numbers, the yes votes from the first vote to the second vote really didn't change very much. It went up like 25 votes. So that was a pretty stable group. The no votes, though, there were 450 some odd people that voted the first time that didn't come the second time. And so there was a drop off. So I just think what I've heard that could get us to yes, some of the no voters to yes, I think, if we could agree to some things, and I think these things aren't real reaches. I mean, one of the things they've asked for, and we've heard it repeatedly, is can we do some financial modeling, both for debt and just mill rates in the future? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of, it's difficult to do, but actually it's been on the goal of the finance committees for a couple of years, so it's not, we've been working toward it. So that's kind of an ask. And, you know, I think, so where I would be on some of these things, and I'll go down through the list, I think if we, I think what they're asking for is if we could just, if there could be a consensus on the council that we would, no answers tonight, but if we could work toward these things, that might get us to yes um, without significant changes. Um, they also talk about, gee, is there a way we could do some type of efficiency analysis, whether we use our own teams to do that or we go outside to have someone come in? And that could really be a win-win. I mean, we may have efficiency experts that come in and say, we're doing, we're nailing everything, and it's great. Then that takes all of that stuff off the table about, you know, are we spending our money wisely? If we find some things, that's all great. But it'd be a commitment to some type of efficiency look at it. And it could be led by our own teams here. Um, maybe something about a new budget process I kind of look at, or not, or just enhancing what we're doing. I mean, I look at the public safety committee, which we're all, people from the community that came together. That was a very, you know, they were here and they presented the $22 million building. That seemed to be a process that everybody had input. I know some people that started the process that may not have been in favor of the project. By the end of the project, became one of the bigger supporters. So there may be a way, and we don't have to answer it tonight. And then I think the other thing they're asking us to do is, let's just look ahead, because as difficult as this year is, Next year, you know, I mean, we can, we can look at the numbers, but next year is going to be equally challenging unless, you know, we, no one knows about state funding. If we get more state funding, that solves it, but we've been down that path. But if we look at just the pure numbers, we're going to have a similar conversation next year. So we need to get this community to a healthier place. So I think if we, we thought about that, and then the last piece of it is, and I think, you know, in the way I think the municipal side, we've kind of said each year, whatever the number is, you know, and, and there's no numbers here, but whatever the number is, you know, we've asked Tom and his teams to develop a certain, whether it's 2% or 3% or 4%, he always delivers a budget at the first read that hits that mark, and then we can talk about things we may want to add. Could we consider a similar process for the school budget? That, and, and, and actually, again, the superintendent has said, just give me a number. I'm not, I'm not suggesting any number here, but if, if I think if we had a consensus around this table that we were willing to entertain and work those things and say that we've heard some of the concerns, I think we could get to yes pretty quickly. Um, I think if, if these things we're not willing to kind of open up and do, then I think that that changes the number that we need to get to, to yes. So just, just a thought. So then, yours, Chris, I think the number you put out is some of these things are on the table. I think that's, that's reasonable. I think if we're not willing to sort of in, at least entertain the conversations, then it may be a different number is where I'd be. So this, I mean, first of all, I don't think anything's off the table. I mean, I think everything has to be on the table to discuss at the right venue. I think these are policy and process questions that I, I, I think uh, would probably be better served sort of taken up in finance uh, because I think that these are more these are more process and policy questions and not necessarily are germane to the budget right now we've got to this budget through the process that we have these are systemic changes that I would be hesitant to personally I'd be hesitant to commit to them as a, a, a for lack of a better word like a quid pro quo to say we're only going to do this and I know you're suggesting that, I'm not saying that. I know but, I, but I'm saying that I think I think 
these things can all be looked at and should all be looked at and discussed, but I think that that's more of an issue for finance. Yeah, you know Chris, what I mean? And, and Chris, I think where I was going, though, is because of the, the time frame that we have. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just talked about the time frame. Yeah. Those things aren't going to happen. So all I was looking for, I mean, what I'm trying to suggest, I think if we as, if the consent, all we're trying to do around this table is get consensus. If the consensus was these things are worth putting on our table to look at for next year's budget process, whether it's finance or whatever the mechanism is, and not not suggesting there's any outcome at this point, but these are things we're willing to work toward and entertain and think about. I think that helps us move this thing forward. And I, it, all this was trying to say is, do any of those things make sense, or do we not want to do those things? So that's that's the thought. So the, the just to deal with a couple of them. Yeah. The the benchmarking one, which really goes to efficiencies, because it's a comparative analysis of, of how, you're, how you stack up against other communities and their departments. That's something that GPCOG is right in the middle of organizing. Scarborough has already submitted data on that. Uh, I endorse that. So if you wanted a, a thumbs up on that suggestion of looking at uh, uh, how efficient we are, yeah, I'm okay. Whether I'm not sure, I I would limit it to or or say we need to bring in no, no. Uh, a and I and I definitely agree that the finance committee is the deepest into the weeds of uh, statistical analysis, and it's the place where I'd be comfortable having this finance committee, which functioned very well this year. Uh, and uh, on the second point about dis uh, discussions with the Board of Education about sort of getting on the same page as far as initial budgets are concerned, that's a discussion that I think I'd be very comfortable seeing the finance committees, the two of them, have a discussion and see where they are. So those are two of the <coughs> principal ones that you've talked about, and I'm, I'd, be, I'd be very comfortable having the finance committee of the town council to carry those forward. Well, um, so I, I think um, to the specifically to the efficiency analysis, I have, I have two concerns. Um, one would be uh, the cost, and I'd want to see that but account, but account for in the budget. Uh, and the second one would just be culturally, if if we were to impose an efficiency analysis on an organization that was unappreciative uh, or resistant to it, I think it would be. Um, uh, problematic, and I, I guess I'd like, I'm certainly, if it were in the budget, I'd be supportive of it because it would be coming from that organization that would be requesting it. Um, and actually, but otherwise, I think I'd, I'd be... Um, actually, I think Julie, I think Tom and Julie have had some conversations. I think Julie has sort of, with her organization, sort of started down some pathways anyway, and there yep. may be a way to kind of piggyback so it seems like that's kind of already in sort of their culture of at least looking mm -hmm. at it. And that, that I, I, I would that's agree with Will that it shouldn't be thrust upon okay. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, a yeah. well, independent. Yeah. Oh no, I don't know if we can. Can we can't? It, can we even legally do that? Well, well, I, but think that's you know, I think you have to keep in mind too. There's the potential that it come December, you've got three brand new counselors. Yeah. So. I mean, hopefully not, but I'm just saying it, there is a chance that in some <laughs> December you might have three new people sitting here. Mm -hmm. And if you are to put, not that I don't agree with these recommendations, because I actually do, um, I don't know how you impose those on the BOE and another sitting council. So I think this is a discussion that, and I understand where you're coming from, is that people are just looking for reassurement. These are things that we're recognizing, that they're on our, that we're, we see them, we know that there's an issue, um, we want to make changes. Uh, the communication committee is having a, having a round table at the end of the month solely focused on budgeting, budget process, trying to brainstorm. Um, so I think people need to know we're not ignoring it. Um, but I am, I'm, I am concerned a little bit about how do, how do we reassure that these things are important to us because right now our, this community does not trust us. So uh, We've heard that repeatedly in o over three intense meetings. We've heard from, from three very different groups that this is a community that does not trust this council. And I would like to rephrase that because I take offense. I think some people in this, oh, yeah. some people in this community don't trust us. Well, I, I understand. It's a very di big difference when you say the community. Without making very it a Well, very different. Very different. I, 
I'm saying that out of 80 people, the consensus was that they didn't trust us. They didn't think that we were doing the right thing. And that, so that's just what I'm reporting back. And so I'm, I'm asking if that is, if people feel that way, how do we reassure them that we do really, this is really what we want to do. And we do want to make sure that people understand that it's important to us and we do hear them. I just don't know how to do that. Um, so I, I think I, I agree with, and I don't know that every single bullet that Peter outlined is necessarily the right bullet, but I think in concept it is exactly what we need to do to really make, because I, what I kept hearing is, you know, well, one town, one budget is just a slogan. And for some people right now, that's, it's not that, that they believe that. Right. And that's the only reason I'd be willing to entertain opening the municipal budget, because for me it is not a slogan. I had nothing to do with beginning that concept, but I do buy into it. Um, but I think we haven't been doing all of these things to fully get our community to buy into it. So forming some kind of a, an ad hoc committee, uh, kind of like, you know, for the, you know, safety Please building, sure. that kind of thing. I would like to see, so I do support all of those things. I appreciate what you put out there, Chris. I don't think, this, I mean, it makes me crazy to think that 0 .08 <laughs> is uh, the difference if we, if we, you know, to go forward. I, I want to see some systemic changes. I think that's what people are really wanting to know is how are we going to be, how are we looking forward? That's right. Um, so I, that makes me nervous. It makes me a little better. It make me, makes me a little more comfortable, combined with some assurances that we're going to institute some changes to our process. Um, I guess I'll leave it there for now. Well, sorry. I had my, my only second point was I totally agree with the point about the the building committee. I think that was just a terrific success and a very successful model. I don't necessarily know that it would um, translate quite quite the same to an annual budgeting process, but I, I certainly think that um, it should be. Explored, because I think the more knowledge that we can get, get and share and broaden, um, it really at the really detailed level, I think it's really super helpful, and I, I've observed it on the building committee as well. And, and, and Will, I actually, you know, part of this, I mean, we kind of float different ideas, but one thing I found intriguing is I, Pine Point has a Sunday morning coffee, whatever, and I happened to go down, and there was someone that was actually, her mom lived in Harpswell, and Harpswell, it's a different town, type of government. But what they have in Harpsville is they do have sort of a budget advisory committee that meet, and they meet all year round, and they deal with some of these issues. And then, so there's a, and it, they say it's a pretty successful model at trying, they always pass the budget the first time. It's pretty participatory. So I think there's some, maybe some benchmark and other things, and I think to get to your point, you know, Kate, I, I don't think, we can't commit to any of these things tonight, but I like, I like you know, Councilor Donovan's suggestion that if, if it becomes the charge of, a committee somewhere, whether it's finance or wherever it, 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 it's appropriate to be, and we at least make a commitment that we're going to at least discuss these things and work on them. I think that's that is a, a good faith step forward for the community saying we've heard some of your comments. We're, we're not sure of the answers, yeah. but right. yeah, give us some time to kind right. of work this and, through. And I guess my my only hesitation is I'm I'm all, like I said everything needs to be on the table. We're always looking at process improvements. I think we're already starting to do a lot of these yeah. things in finance already. I just don't want it to be misconstrued that that's conditional on the budget. You, you know what I mean? I don't want, I don't want us to sit here and say, we will do everything that's on a list. Or because, I mean, these things, you know, in fairness, we always discuss them in a lot of detail and looks at, at, look at consequences and outcomes of each one of these and have that ability to have that discussion in public with, with public comment yeah, and everything else. So I can certainly commit to doing that process. I think we should be doing that regardless of whenever we, we do this. I just I don't I, I I don't want the perception up there that it's tied to a a number budget vote. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. So um, individually, Peter, absolutely. You know, our responsibility and our job as counselors is to um, have that dialogue and have that communication. So I will commit as, as a member of the finance committee at, and your chair. So in some ways, you set that agenda. So if you want that to start immediately completely supported. I can tell you that I have a consternation with some of the bullets and some of the points that you brought up, but we'll have that conversation okay. and I'll make that extremely clear. Um, as far as the dollar amount and which budget, I think that um, the school's budget as it is currently approved and even when it was approved the first time is a defensible budget. It's a good budget. Um, we took a lot of um, hard work that went into that and you, you were part of that leadership team with that joint session. And so any of the conversations that we have about 
not mandates, but things that we want to implement, we need the other seven partners or eight Absolutely. partners, including the superintendent, at the table to get the buy-in and get their feedback because we have taken too much time and effort um, with a lot of rewards in building that relationship and to blow that up by mandating to them that they um, have to get an efficiency right. auditor or efficiency person or, or um, they have to commit to X dollars when we don't have the authority to set that. Um, isn't a type of relationship that I'm comfortable in creating or I'm destroying what we've already built up. Um, as far as the um, which budget, I think while it's a defensible budget, the fact is the voters um, do, do matter and they have told us twice that it's the school's budget. So I'm more in line with where Chris kind of started and, and what the impact is of 50000 You know, I don't know if we'll get to it, but Tom did do an analysis about, you know, depending on what you want to achieve, there is no way in heck I will ever approve a $1.5 million budget um, cut um, in order to get a 3% um, net increase. But it's, to me, irresponsible for this community to do that. So um, I won't, so my two outliers are I'm comfortable with 50000 I'm also comfortable in saying there is no, there is no adjustment. I am not comfortable with $1.5 million. Um, so, you know, I have my own ideas where they could make that adjustment and have no impact to the students but it's not my place to make that recommendation. That's the school board. So I'll stay away from this like everyone else is, but um, I will be comfortable with 50000 Just to pick up on uh, Chris's 50000 number, we probably all went through this process, but uh, I looked at what, what is the landscape here, and it's that we're almost evenly split in that last vote. Uh, uh, so we're not far off from getting the budget passed. Uh, that sort of eliminated a large cut for me. But I respect the vote uh, as it came down, and it came down in favor of this budget is not acceptable. So some cut was necessary. It's the only budget they get to vote on, and so I wonder sometimes if it isn't really the school, but I just the feedback that I get from people I see uh, uh, walking, just walking around Higgins Beach said, it's the school. It's the school budget. Don't touch the town budget because we're satisfied with the town budget. So I, I do, and these were people who were pro-school. Uh, so uh, when I get to that stage, I said, well, it can't be zero and can't be de minimis. Uh, it can't be $10,000 or 20. So I get up to 25,000 and I start saying, well, could it be 25? Is that material enough? Uh, and I kind of talked myself out of it. Uh, I got to 40, and I kind of settled in, and I liked 40. Uh, but then I got kind of almost cold feet uh, and said, well, 50 is a teacher. And that, that struck me on a human side as material. That's a material cut in a circumstance where the vote was pretty darn close. Uh, so that's sort of how I w got to the same number as Chris wrote, that 50 seemed to be the right number. Any other comments, questions? We're coming down to, we've got two minutes to um, take a break and uh, start our next meeting. Um, if there's no other questions or comments, I'd like to adjourn the workshop and go directly into our meeting. Objections. Very good. Thank you, everybody.